Welcome to Douglas Wilson's The Podcast. This audio is brought to you by Canon Press. Before we get started, I wanted to recommend to you Glenn Sunshine's Slang Leviathan, Limited Government and Resistance in the Christian Tradition. How are we to respond to the threats to liberty we are facing? Starting to answer that question begins with this book. We are remarkably unaware of our own Christian history. By Glenn's Slang Leviathan today at canonpress.com. Welcome to the podcast. This is episode 196. 196. So, one of the things I'm working on uh, currently is um, the problem that is posed to theonomists or to people who believe uh, that societies are necessarily theocratic. And, and we want to say, well, we're Christians and we serve the Christian God, so the God that we want to be the God of this theocracy would be the Christian God, right? And I would put myself in that category. And then when people say, well, what about free speech? And I would say, well, I'm entirely for it. Even, even the speech of unbelievers? And I'd say, yes. Even the speech of someone who's doubting the resurrection of Jesus or doubting the existence of God and so forth? How, how can you believe in free speech and at the same time be an advocate of theonomy, taking the Old Testament law as authoritative and binding for today. How can you do both those things at the same time? I can understand you doing one, and I can understand you doing the other, but what is the theocratic case for free speech? There are two ways to approach this. C.S. Lewis says somewhere that, that there are two different ways you can approach democracy. You can say democracy is a good thing because every, you have such deep and abiding faith in man that Everybody's opinion is so valuable and so much to be uh, treasured that we should find out, do our level best to find out what everybody thinks before we decide to do something, and that's what an election is. We're checking with all the wise people. C.S. Lewis said that's a basic, basically a romantic and false view of man, and he is a Democrat for the opposite reason, where he says that man is fallen and corrupt. And man is so fallen and so corrupt that what you want to do is spread the power as thinly as possible. Okay? You want to give everybody a little bit of power so they all guard it jealously and nobody, no corrupt person gets too much power. Then you couple this with another biblical principle, which is when the Bible requires us to not convict a man of any crime unless we have two or three witnesses that will convict him. What's riding in the background of that biblical standard, you need two or three witnesses before you convict a man, is the principle that it is better for a guilty man to go free than for an innocent man to be falsely charged and convicted. Let me say that again. The biblical standard, it is better for a criminal to get away with it than it is for an innocent man to be hanged. So, let's say someone commits a murder, and it's the perfect crime, they get away with it. That is to be preferred to the alternative of hanging the wrong man for that crime. So there's a principle involved there, and this, this drives into the free speech discussion. When someone says, yeah, but are you going to, in your theocratic, in your ideal theocratic biblical republic, there's a guy down in the public square and he's got a screw loose, but he's standing on the park bench blaspheming. He's saying all sorts of awful things about Jesus and about the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary, and he's just railing and vituperative. How does this principle you just laid out apply to that? Well, it's not just individuals who blaspheme. Governments blaspheme. And when governments blaspheme, it's far more serious. It's far more serious when governments blaspheme. So when a government blasphemes, they're able to coercively impose the blasphemy on everybody. When one guy with a screw loose, when one guy goes off his meds and starts yelling things he shouldn't, he's relatively harmless. But if we give the state the power 
to lock that guy up for his blasphemy. What we're doing is giving the state the power to blaspheme with impunity. Okay? So you're, when you're willing to, and this goes back to the previous thing, where it'd be better for a guilty man to go free than for an innocent man to be hanged, I don't want to give the government the power or the authority to hang an innocent man because a crime was committed and we have to hang somebody. That gives the state too much power. So what do I mean by this? Well, when someone says, well, if you're, you're not a true theocrat, you're not a true theonomist, unless you're willing to give the state the power to execute someone for blaspheming the Lord Jesus Christ, for blaspheming the living God. Well, here's the thing. We must never forget that Jesus was arraigned and tried and convicted on a first table of the law accusation. The crime he was convicted of was blasphemy, right? The crime he was convicted of was blasphemy. And so it seems to me that if, there, if there's any group of people in the world who ought to be really nervous about giving the state the power to execute blasphemers, it would be Christians, because our Lord, our Lord was uh, convicted on that basis for that reason. And Stephen himself, Stephen, the first Christian martyr, was also convicted on a first table offense. He was accused of blasphemy. Now, someone's going to say, yeah, but you're giving me an argument here. What about the, uh, what about the blasphemers under Moses who were uh, executed? Yeah, you have to understand something else about all this. When God gave the law to Israel, that was a description that was a description of his holy will. So when blasphemers were executed under Moses, or according to the law of Moses, I have no problem with it. That law was holy, just, and good. But one of the things we have to do is reckon with or deal with the differences between the old and the new covenant. For example, in the old covenant, Israel invaded Canaan. They were told to steer clear of all the Canaanites. They weren't supposed to marry any of the any of the Canaanites, where they were to cast down the idols, they were to cleanse the land and and so on. In the New Testament, we are told to go fraternize with the Canaanites. In the Old Testament, unholiness was contagious. In the New Covenant, holiness is contagious. In the New Covenant, Jesus goes around touching lepers. He goes he goes and finds unclean sick people and touches them and heals them. His holiness, his, his healing is contagious. And then when Paul, Paul says, uh, when you're invited uh, by a pagan to come to a dinner party, Paul says, go. If, if you want to go, go. And you don't know what idol the meat was sacrificed to. Don't worry about it. Now, that seems to me to be not a radical shift of standards because idolatry is always sinful and blasphemy is always sinful. But in the New Covenant, we are encouraged, we are, we are taught to go out knowing that our weapons are not carnal, but they're mighty for tearing down strongholds. So this is all, I know that this is not uh, organized systematically yet. I'm hoping to write this up and, and I'll post it on my blog when I do. But basically what it boils down to is a biblical view of man and the nature of men who are running the government, I think, requires us to be very suspicious of giving authority and power to governments that will enable them to blaspheme. Blaspheming governments are a far greater threat than blaspheming mentally ill people. So we're continuing on with Plodcast 196. Continuing on with Plodcast 196, and this is, of course, Hamartiology. So we've been studying the sins of the New Testament, and we've been doing that for some years now, and we are only in the deltas. We are only in the Ds. This is, of course, hamartiology. There are a lot of sins here. We come now to a word that is used only twice in the New Testament, and that is the word for doubt, distadzo. Both uses are found in Matthew. The first instance is when Jesus was seen by his disciples walking on the water, and Peter asked if he could come out to him. Jesus said that he could, and Peter started out very well. But when he saw the wind and the waves, Peter started to sink. Matthew 14.31 says, And immediately Jesus stretched forth his hand and caught him, 
and said unto him, O thou of little faith, wherefore didst thou doubt? There's our word, therefore didst thou doubt. Now, on the one hand, we can charge Peter with sin here, because Jesus does admonish him. Jesus calls him uh, someone of little faith. He says that Peter was one of little faith, and he asks him why he doubted. There's our word, distazzo. But before we all pile on Peter for his lack of faith, walking as he did for only ten feet before starting to sink, we should all consider that he walked ten feet farther than on, on water than any of us have. So when it comes to water walking, let us please recall that Peter is the silver medalist. The other use of uh, this word, distazzo, is clearly sinful. After the resurrection, Jesus appeared to his disciples in various ways and in, in ways that established the fact of his resurrection. He used, as Luke puts it in the book of Acts, many infallible proofs. That's Acts 1.3. But the second use of distazzo is in Matthew 28.17. And when they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. There it is, some doubted. Now, I'm, I'm assuming, this is my surmise, I can't prove this, but the Apostle Paul tells us in 1 Corinthians 15, that Jesus, in his resurrection appearances, appeared at one time to over 500 people at once. Now, none of the resurrection appearances that are recorded where there's dialogue back and forth are that instance when Jesus appears at the end of the Gospel of John on the shores of Galilee or in the upper room. It's just a handful of disciples that are there. But Paul tells us that there was at least one occasion where there were hundreds of people, and I'm guessing that it was this occasion in Matthew 28. But when they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. Well, a crowd of 500 people is pretty significant, and I'm, I'm assuming that perhaps the doubters were at the back of the crowd and couldn't see very well. They uh, were craning their necks, and they didn't get the full impact. Continuing on with Plodcast, episode 196. My book review, this time around, is uh, a recent book by Carl Truman, The Rise and Triumph of the Modern Self. Now, Carl Truman is a mixed bag. I, I, read, I read a book of his some years ago, maybe 10 years or so ago, a book called Republicrat, and it was okay. It was good parts, and I remember one line from it. He said, no matter how the election goes, the government always seems to get in. Yeah, that was, that was good. And, and then uh, Carl Truman uh, blurbed uh, Rachel Miller's book. Rachel Miller wrote a book called Beyond Authority and Submission, which uh, that book was bad enough to make your teeth ache. And the, um, the historical work that she did in there was simply laughable. It, and, and Truman is, um, is a really competent historian. He really knows he really knows his, um, his stuff, and he blur- but he blurbed Rachel Miller's book and, and gave it the kind of high praise it didn't deserve. And so that makes, man, Carl's the kind of person who, if you look at this book, uh, sees exactly what's going on in our day. It, this, is a, this book is stellar. This book is really, really good. But I wonder, I, I, things that make you go, huh, are why does Carl Truman see the sweep of centuries? You know, how can he trace all this funny business that we're dealing with from Rousseau and Nietzsche and others on down? How can, he, how can he trace all the threads back and forth, in and out, over the course of centuries? And he doesn't see what's, what's going on outside his front door. I don't know. I don't know the answer to that question. But I, lest I go on too long and wind up damning him with faint praise, or <laughs> worse than that, let me just say that this book, The Rise and Triumph of the Modern Self, is one of the best books I've read in a long time. It is really, really good. If you want to understand, if, you, if you're trying to figure out how everything went so crazy, lots of Christians, almost all Christians, all faithful Christians, know that the world has gone crazy. What Carl Truman does here is he helps to explain why. Why did that happen? So when uh, the example he uses is when someone says, I felt like a woman trapped in a man's body. I felt like a woman trapped in a man's body. There's a certain kind of culture where that kind of statement makes some sort of sense. There are other cultures where if you said, I, felt, I feel like a woman trapped in a man's body, 
they would commit you or put you under on bed rest or something. You're talking off your nut. You're talking out of your head. That's that's no good, right? So in our culture, th- that statement, that kind of statement, and far zooier, flies. You can be interviewed by a newspaper reporter. You can be interviewed by a television reporter and say that sort of thing on air. And people will bend over backwards to accommodate you. Generals, admirals, politicians will applaud your bravery. They will appoint you to government uh, positions. And a certain kind of intellectual history is necessary to establish the preconditions for that kind of thing making sense to people. And Carl Truman does a magnificent job in tracing the intellectual history, whether it has to do with uh, Freud or the, the Frankfurt School, the, the cultural Marxism, the, all of these things he ties together, and he ties together in a wonderful way. If you live in a, in a loony part of the country, or, and that's probably pretty much everywhere, if you're trying to make sense of the crazy things going on around you, this is the book, uh, The Rise and Triumph of the Modern Self. Thank you.